Good afternoon. My name is Scott McCutcheon of Sovereign Studios. Welcome to episode 23 of my Yamaha Virago Cafe Racer project. Um, this is uh, kind of an int uh, a weird episode, uh, mostly because uh, I'm in the middle of also doing episode 22. 20, yeah, 22, right? So this is 23 that we're going to be doing right now. Um, but 22, uh, if you just watched that previously, um, 22 is where we're painting the tank. But instead of just watching paint dry, uh, I wanted to move on and keep working, um, you know, to make some progress on the, the next step. Um, so while the paint's drying, we're going to be doing this, this one. Uh, that being said, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about our next steps and how we're going to um, progress with putting this bike together. So the, uh, the biggest step that we need, to, we need to finish, the biggest goal we need to accomplish here is to get the battery box mounted. So that's not going to be today's video, but uh, this is the prototype that I've, I've put together for the battery box. Uh, it's not exactly finished, but it's pretty close. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're getting there, but to facilitate the battery box, I need to make myself a little more room uh, to work with. So we're going to be mounting it down in the bottom uh, where the original OEM center stand used to be you know so that's missing now um, and we're gonna put the battery box down there but I need to you know make a little room for myself to work down there so we're gonna get the bike in the air that's why I have this lift out here uh, while the bike is in the air there's a couple things that um, that I've been holding off doing while the bike was sitting on its wheels you know like I recently moved and stuff like that so the bike had to be transported in my pickup and uh, you know I really needed needed it to be movable on its own so that's why it's sitting on its wheels now but now I need to get the bike back up in the air so while it's there um, we're gonna be looking at two things the first is uh, this kinda works out pretty well too because while we're in the while I have the paint booth set up and we're doing painting for the gas tank. Uh, you know, I've been holding off painting this front wheel, uh, which is something we're gonna have to do. So we're gonna go ahead and get that done. Uh, and then the, the other is the rear wheel. Well, you know, we painted the rear wheel back in episode two when we painted the rest of the bike. Uh, but there's always been something that I didn't much like about the rear wheel, and that's uh, its spokes. Right, so you see the spoke design of the, that wheel, and then you compare it to the spoke design of the R6 front wheel. Well, the R6 front wheel is just, I mean, it's probably hard to see with those huge rotors, but it's just five, a five spoke wheel, you know, real standard, single spoke, uh, five, you know, five spoke wheel. Whereas this one is this like split spoke, it's, I guess five spokes if you count them, but technically now it's ten. So, you know, just, just looking at it, it looks different. So there is a way around this. The uh, later model Viragos, uh, the second generation, I think from 88 and up. It's like 88 to 99 or whenever they stop making Viragos, but those wheels, their rear is a 15 inch diameter, but it's got five spokes. Um, so I've seen some folks on the forum that are, you know, doing the uh, second gen conversion. Uh, the benefit of this second gen conversion also means that you can use a fatter tire. So from the factory, this is a uh, a 130. I forgot exactly. It's like a yeah, it's a 130. Um, 13060 R16 or something like that. Uh, and it's just real thin, right? It's almost as thin as the front. It's a 130, the front's a 120. You know, so the front's your standard R6 tire, that's a 120, uh, 120, 60, 17, I think. Um, 
120 70 17 120 70 zr17 that's the um the yamaha r6 front but this one on the back uh i forgot exactly i don't have a light on me at the moment Yeah, this was a Dunlop D404 that's a, uh, a 130-90-16. Yeah, so 130-90-16. I've been reading on the forums where the folks do the, uh, the second gen wheel swap and they can get a 150-90-15 onto the back of this. Um, I'm surprised that that's a thing considering the amount of clearance like yeah There's a lot of clearance on this end here, but there is like no clearance right here, so I'm not sure if the You know the later model Virago just pushed this over Which is probably true But uh, I've ordered the parts so they're on their way But to facilitate that we're gonna be pulling the wheels off this guy um, So today's episode we're going to pull the bike up into the air, we're going to get the wheels popped off, and uh, we'll get the front one into the paint booth, and the rear one we'll prepare for when we get the parts to do the rear wheel, or the second gen wheel conversion. Okay, so first thing we're going to want to do before we uh, lift the bike is remove the bottom collector. Mostly because I don't want to scratch it with the, uh, with the lift when I roll it under here. But also just because it'll just be out of the way and we won't have to worry about it uh, when we start working under here. Um, one of the other things I've all, that I wanted to do after doing the last video is I really wanted to put some anti-seize grease uh, inside these sleeves so that these don't get rusted together or something like that and they're easier to slide off in the future. Um, so this will provide a good opportunity for us to do that. And then don't forget about the uh, springs on the back like I just did. Okay, so uh, with the intention being to work down under here to mount the battery, we're gonna get the tire out of the way so that we have, you know, a lot more room there. Uh, and we're gonna be able to get the bike up in the air to do that. Um, but because we're also gonna be doing some wiring with the starter, and how the wire for the starter wraps around this side of the engine. I don't want to be obstructed by the jack while I'm doing this work um, on this side of the bike. So we're actually going to slide the jack in from the left side of the bike. The problem with that, of course, is the kickstand. Um, which hopefully will be less of a problem here in a second. So. It balances pretty well on its own. Let's just kick that up out of the way. Slide the jack up under there. <clears throat> and find a good, uh, good place for it to mount. And we'll go ahead and cram a few uh, wood blocks under here once we have a good height. Just to make sure that, you know, in case that hydraulic pump fails or something like that, the bike's not gonna come, you know, crashing down. So, okay, so we're up in the air, looking good. Okay, and then uh, to take the front wheel off, uh, we're gonna start by taking the calipers off. So we'll pop the calipers off both sides. And uh, you can see, actually, I'm, I mean, you can see it here. This one is like a little wet. There's like a uh, film kind of fluid film that I'm almost certain is the fork so the, I'm pretty sure this fork is leaking so we're probably gonna end up having to do an R&R &R on that which uh, we may do soon uh, I'm gonna look into how difficult this is to accomplish and we'll decide when to do it but it looks like we're gonna end up having to do it um, but for now we're gonna pop the brake calipers off and uh, get ready to remove the front wheel uh, for our case, to remove the this caliper, uh, it's real easy. It's just two bolts. But for us, we're going to have to pull the mounting bracket off as well. So we'll pull the bracket for the speed sensor as well as uh, the brake line bracket. 
And then from there, we can go ahead and pop these these guys off. And then these look like uh, 12, yeah, 12 millimeters. Um, 12 millimeter bolts. Yep, there we go. All right. And with the uh, bolts out of place, this thing should just slide right off. And there we go. So the, uh, the added benefit of pulling these off is it gives me the opportunity to, uh, you know, check out the brake pads, which is something I hadn't done since we uh, first installed this. So we, had, we, you know, we pretty much just installed it and didn't bother looking at it, <laughs> you know, this deep. So this is the first time I've pulled these off. Uh, it looks to me, you know, like the brakes are in good shape. Um, I mean, they're not bad. Uh, I mean, they are pretty low. They're obviously used. Um, well, I mean, they're kind of crappy. So I'm going to go ahead and order uh, new pads uh, for this, you know, while we have the wheel off. And that way we can go ahead and make sure that we get the, uh, you know, the best, the best stuff. Um, so we'll order new pads for this guy. But for now, we can just... Uh, kind of put it up and out of the way. You want to go ahead and secure this somewhere, anywhere, just to make sure that it uh, doesn't go flying around uh, while we're working. It doesn't have to be tight or anything. We just don't want it going anywhere. All right, let's do the other side. Yeah, it looks like a pretty fair amount of fork oil coming out of that. Yeah, look at all that grease that's accumulating underneath it. Oh yeah, that one looks terrible, comparatively. Pretty well gunked up. Um, there's a lot of residue there that I'm going to assume is fork oil. That fork must have just exploded all over the place. I mean, unless this caliper is leaking, which I suppose could be a thing. But I mean, it's everywhere. I wonder if this caliper is bad. Well, we'll get the opportunity to uh, clean it up here in a bit. And we clean this caliper up as best we can for now. Uh, we'll get a little bit better uh, once we pull the uh, brake pads out. Um, cause yeah, this, uh, this down here, uh, the more I look at it, the more it's a definite problem. Uh, it looks to me like the, uh, like the fork has started leaking. Um, and, uh, I'm not really sure how, but it looks to me like the fork has started leaking and it's just going all over the place and it's been contaminating the caliper like that. I suppose it could also be brake fluid, uh, which has me a little concerned that maybe it, maybe this caliper is bad. Um, but considering the residue that's all over here and everything all over here, and the fact that it's not really like, you know, it hasn't been dripping, uh, and I've been clamping on the brake, you know, like it seems fine in terms of that. But, um, Maybe we'll do a functional test on the calipers here uh, in a bit. But either way, I'm going to end up replacing the brake pads in them, so it's good that we pulled them off. And it's good that we rec uh, recognize this as a problem. So while the wheel's off, I might just go ahead and rebuild the forks. But uh, again, I'm going to look into what that would take uh, before we go down that road. Uh, that being said, I think we're ready to pull the axle out. So getting to the axle on this guy is really just loosening these uh, clamp bolts down at the bottom. And then uh, I think we just pull it, just pull it right out. So let's give that a shot. All right, and 22 wrench, that might be easier at this point. And then now I think the axle just pushes out. Yeah, so not exactly ideal, but it will come out this way. Now that the bolt's out, just a little note 
to some of the readers or watchers out there. If you're like me and don't have anywhere good to uh, tie this thing up to, like you know, like an I beam or uh, you know something above you, nor do you have anywhere real good to tie it down to, you know, um, the when you pull the wheel off and this thing becomes unbalanced, the, you know, the bike might fall over. So cram something under the rear wheel for now so that you can, you know, keep it from toppling over when we pull the wheel off. Um, and there we go. Okay, so in terms of the front wheel itself, uh, you want to go ahead and remove these spacers from both sides of the wheel. Um, inside of the wheel bearings, which these uh, look like they're probably okay. Seals are in good shape. This was the side where that fork oil has been coming down. But yeah, so before we can paint it, obviously we want to pull the rotors off, and that's just these uh, Torx bits here. So let's go ahead and do that. And it's worth noting that this was the right hand side rotor, uh, since I think we're going to reuse these. Very cool. So yeah, I guess this is a white painted rim or stripe. Uh, because it's like underneath the clear coat. Um, but that's no worries. We'll uh, go ahead and clean the rim up here uh, and prepare it for painting. It's pretty much clean. Uh, the one thing we are going to do before we paint it, we're going to knock the wheel weights off. Uh, we want to make sure that we get uh, all of it painted where we need it painted um, we want to make sure that we got a good service because we're going to end up replacing the tire anyway real soon. I've already got those ordered, so we'll just knock the wheel weights off, give it a good coat of paint, and then go get it, uh, get new tires mounted and balanced on it. Okay, with the wheel weights off and the, uh, wheel cleaned up, this thing is sort of ready to paint, but the nature of it, um, you know, being a used rim, it's pretty beat up in terms of nicks and scratches and that sort of thing. Um, so like there's some pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good blemishes along that rim. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hit it with some sandpaper uh, to smooth that out, uh, smooth out some of those sections and uh, then we'll be ready. We uh, roughed it up real good with the sandpaper. Uh, all around, cleaned it up, and it should give us a good base to paint from. Now that everything's nice and smooth, there's no real blemishes on it anymore. Because uh, it looks like, you know, it looks like somebody took it off road, kinda, and got hit with gravel a bunch. But we'll give it a coat of paint and then be ready to spray it with the rest of everything. Okay, and then when you go to take the rear, rear wheel off, uh, it's going to be kind of unbalanced, so you're going to want to find some way to stabilize the bike while it's on the stand. In this case, I just, uh, you know, got a, a, you know, anchor strap for the truck and just kind of tied it directly to the stand itself. Not ideal. It's not really going to save it from toppling over or anything like that but it will give it a, a little more stability laterally uh, when I go to remove the wheel so that should be good enough I think hopefully uh, well worst comes to worst we put another one on the other side in case we need it but I don't think we will so we'll get there okay so uh, so we got a lot of our parts painted and dried. Um, however, we uh, we got in the rest of the parts for our wheel conversion, but we're gonna want to hit those with paint as well. 
Um, so we'll get to talking about this wheel conversion here in a bit, but uh, this is the second generation Virago wheel um, that will allow us to mount a fatter tire uh, as well as give us five spokes to match the uh, OEM Yamaha R6 front wheel, which has five spokes. So we want to we want to get them to match as best we can. So that's the swap we're going to do. Uh, but we're going to uh, we just got these in the mail today, and you know it's looking pretty rough. So we're going to go ahead and scuff it up. This is the uh, rear brake drum from the second gen. Uh, so we'll get that scuffed up. Here's the rear axle we'll use, um, and we'll slap these with a coat of paint as well before we actually hit them with our you know final uh, final coating of flat and the uh, matte clear. So let's get started. Okay, with another coat uh, drying, right? We just put another coat of paint on there. We're going to go ahead and get the rear wheel off of the, the Virago um, so that we can prepare ourselves for the second gen conversion. So in terms of removing the rear wheel, um, I don't think we're going to have to remove the swing arm or anything like that. But obviously we're going to have to pull the axle out uh, and then uh, I think we're also going to have to pull out all four of these bolts here uh, and just pull this whole thing apart and then the wheel will come out. Um, additionally, that's also how we're going to have to get in the conversion because it's a tight fit apparently. So we have to basically like put this whole thing together and mount it all in in order to get it to fit right so uh, first things first you pull the cotter pin out of this and uh, then you can take the master nut off the axle let's pull out the uh, license plate bracket and uh, this cotter pin here don't lose those uh, lock washers that go with this bolt and then this just comes out pretty easily Okay, before we uh, slide the axle out and try and remove the wheel, we want to pop these bolts out. So I'm told that with the uh, second gen conversion, uh, that this breaker bar here, or like, uh, I don't know what to call it, but it stops the uh, brake rotor from spinning along with the wheel. And uh, I'm told that we have to uh, find a better way to mount this, so we'll have to basically like you know, mount this a few inches over to get it to clear our new fat tire. Um, I'm not really sure how we're going to work that out yet. Probably just a, uh, you know, long spacer. Something like that. But, uh, it looks like it's definitely got enough clearance to be able to mod that out, so no big deal. But we'll get there. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, we can just pop the bolts out. And then finally, we want to remove the linkage. Uh, and if you recall, this was kind of a kind of a pain to do. Um, so hopefully, we don't have to mess with this. Uh, and we probably will, but for now, I'm going to try and avoid it just to get the wheel off. And then it just pops right out. So I think we can get away with uh, not removing the arm um, but I did get a new one uh, that came with the second gen conversion and this one obviously wasn't painted very well so you know I'm thinking about re you know uh, I already sprayed a first coat on the new one so we might reuse it uh, or reuse the new one instead of reusing this old one so we might end up pulling this off anyway but we'll cross that bridge again when we get there uh, as for that, I think for now we can uh, pull the axle out. And there's the axle out. Now, in terms of actually getting the wheel off, it'll just pop right out. And there we go. So that's the wheel and the brake hub for the old Virago. So we don't reuse any of that stuff. Apparently the uh, 
second gen Virago gears mesh up correctly. Um, they're supposedly the same size. Even though this one has a slightly smaller design. But I'll leave it parked there for now. And we got the Virago with no wheels. So, uh, again, like we're going to reuse this. You know, the, the final drive spline here. We're going to re reuse this. Um, however, we will need to, when we go to install it, we're going to have to remove this piece and actually mount it to the wheel and then slide the whole thing in at once. So we'll have to remove th this and then these four around the edge. And then supposedly that'll, that'll get me to fit that new wheel in there. And let me uh, ride around with the 15 or the, one the 15 inch rim with the 150 width. Okay, with our final coats of clear on the uh, parts there, uh, we're going to let them dry probably about two days. We'll probably just leave them alone for, you know, the next day or two. And then uh, once, uh, once I'm sure they're certain, you know, certainly dry, we'll go ahead and uh, um, do some wet sanding on it, polish the parts with uh, some Meguiar's polishing compound, and then we'll be good to go. Uh, this stuff here. We're, um, we're probably only going to do that stuff to the plastic parts for the Buell as well as uh, uh, the gas tank for the Virago. I don't think we're going to end up doing it for the wheels. Um, I think I'm just going to uh, leave the wheels as is depending on what they feel like to the touch uh, once the clear is all dry. Um, but I do have, uh, as you can see back there, I got new tires. Uh, to slap on those wheels and I'm gonna get them on real fast so uh, probably within the next couple days I'm gonna take it out to one of the shops and have them swap the tires on those rims um, so we can get it back on the bike otherwise uh, I guess we'll catch back up with this video here in a bit okay so with everything painted uh, you know everything looks really good now but uh, we were also able to get new tires mounted so after painting uh, you know, I went and bought the CRF 250, and while I was there, I had the uh, the dealership mount these tires for the Virago. Um, so, you know, we just got a standard uh, standard Michelin replacement for the OEM R6 front. This is a 120 70 17. Um, I think this was a, uh, a Michelin Pilot. Maybe. Um, Power 2CT. Yeah, Michelin Pilot. Right there. So yeah, th these were Michelin Pilots 12070-17. Um, Pilot Power 2CT. Um, that I think is going to be a really good tire for the front. Uh, on the rear, uh, the rear we did something special. So this is a, uh, you know, this is the second generation Virago rim, the 15 inch rim that allowed us to fit a 150 90 15 tire on, on here. So this is a uh, Michelin Commander 2 that we're putting on the rear. Um, and you can see from the uh, comparison to the original tire just how much bigger it really is. I mean, it's massive compared to the other one. So, it's gonna be a little fun to get in and actually install, but it shouldn't be that bad. So, now that we've got new rubber, I'm really excited. The, uh, the shop that installed these gave me this uh, right angle, um, air cap which I thought was pretty cool because the straight one's really tough to get into right there on this rim. Our main goal here today is to really, or this weekend, I really want to get to the battery box and get the battery box installed. But before I finish up the battery box I want to make sure that it actually clears this big fat wheel uh, since we're doing a much larger wheel and tire swapped into that guy. So. 
I want to make sure it clears. So I want to be able to uh, design the battery box and mount it with enough clearance while the wheel is installed. So we're going to go ahead and get the wheel installed, put it back together. So to do that, we're going to have to pull this guy off. And together with the uh, brake drum, we'll put it into the wheel and put, put the whole assembly in place. Um, so that should be kind of fun. We're going to have to make a couple mods to the swing arm that we'll go through here in, here in just a moment. And let's, I guess let's get started. Okay, so as we talked about earlier in the video, the main things we need for this second gen swap are obviously the wheel, including a new tire and uh, at least checked or, or new wheel bearings. And uh, then we also need the second generation brake hub and pads as well as the second generation axle and I guess potentially this uh, you know um, breaker link here so in terms of getting all that stuff to fit it's generally a bolt-on the final drive gear meshes in with the final drive of the wheel perfectly or at least it should we'll find out here in a second um, and the uh, you know, the, this, the axle is the same diameter and everything, so it should be good to go. The only trick with the swing arm is two, twofold. Uh, first is the, uh, you know, the drum hub breaker arm here. We'll need to relocate this a few inches to the right. And then uh, we're going to have to chop off this little hook loop thing that they've welded onto the inside of the subframe. I think this was probably for some wiring, uh, but I don't know what exactly it's for, and we're not going to end up using it, so we're just going to cut it off. Um, and then it should be easy to put back together. And, okay, so in terms of the brake hub, if you just go buy one of these on eBay, they're pretty cheap and they're pretty ubiquitous. Uh, yours is going to be silver. Obviously, we painted this one black, uh, you know, the flat black with that uh, same color as the tank. Um, but if you just go buy one of these on eBay, what's going to happen is they're going to send you one, most likely, that includes the brake pads. Um, like this. And while they may or may not be good, um, you know, chances are you're just going to, while you're at it, you're going to want to replace them. So, if I recall, these just pop open. And you can just pop them out like that. These are your brake shoes. Um, and obviously these uh, rusted out springs. So I got some new ones here. Uh, these EBC, EBC brakes. Um, so we'll take a look at what we get in here. So the new EBC brakes stuff comes with one new spring. Here's a shoe. Here's another shoe. And those do look a lot better. And there's the other spring. Nothing else in the box. So, fancy new brake shoes. These are very clean, which I like. Um, Very good, right? The washer looks pretty good. That still turns all right. Everything else in here looks good. And you'll notice the groove right here that needs to mesh in with the cylinder here. Not bad. And as for getting them on there, um, Right, so something like that. Uh, 
And that's how you install new pads on your drum kit and on your drum hub. Pretty easy to do, no big deal. So now that we have new pads, we can focus on getting the rest of the wheel installed. Okay, so the first step in the swing arm modifications is going to be to remove the final drive hub here. Um, which, if you recall from the installation video, is just the four bolts here and the one bolt here. Um, they are all 14 millimeter. Uh, so it shouldn't be too tough to pop on out. And recall that they all have lock washers that accompany them. And we pull this pin out. You should just be able to slide this right out. And try not to do that if you can avoid it. You probably want to leave that in place as best you can. If only because it's difficult to slide in place. Especially with how we're going to have to do this. Right? And remember there's this guy in here that you're going to want to keep. Okay, so next up is modification of the swing arm uh, so that we can support the fatter tire. Um, this one was only designed to support a uh, 130 width tire, uh, which was the OEM factory size for the Virago 750 from 80, 1981 to 1983. Um, on the second generation Viragos, they, uh, you could get up to a 150 tire mounted on that rim so that's what we've done and to get it to fit inside this swing arm we need to make two modifications uh, the first being we need to cut this tab off and the second being that we need to remove this uh, breaker bar here for the uh, the drum hub uh, the drum hub breaker arm so you'll notice that this one has like a little cotter pin in there so we're gonna have to pull that out and then get this removed um, unfortunately, I was kind of expecting, when I painted this originally, I was kind of expecting to never have to remove this. Uh, I didn't really consider doing this fatter wheel swap, um, so I painted over this, uh, which was probably a mistake, but that's fine. We'll get through it. Alright, so once you get that cotter pin out, it should be easy to just unbolt. 12 millimeter, fit it on there. And you'll notice this is a special kind of bolt with that uh, race just above the threads. Um, in addition, it's got a washer that sits on one side, another washer on this side, a lock washer that time, and the uh, you know the final nut as well as the cotter pin. So they were expecting that thing to fall right the fuck out I guess <laughs> that's some hardcore hardcore stuff um, but yeah so with this um, you know we uh, we're gonna end up having to relocate it a few inches over here so this isn't really gonna become useful for us anymore in terms of how this was mounted you know so uh, we're basically gonna have to get a bunch of washers and spacers to push it over. Uh, as for this, let's go ahead and chop this off. Um, again, like I said, I don't know what it was for. It was probably for wiring or something. Um, but uh, we don't need it, so it's gone. We're gonna cut it. And then, of course, we'll want to grind down those uh, leftover nubs. So let's do that real fast. All right, so we chewed off the paint on that pretty good. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing we can't fix. Easy. Okay, so before we go sliding the wheel in place, uh, we should talk about the axle. 
This is the uh, stock axle that came with the 81 to 87 or 81 to 83. I'm sorry, 81 to 83 first generation Virago. This is the second gen axle. Uh, you can see already that it's a little bit longer, just in length. Um, I don't think that's going to affect us any in how we uh, use this. It's supposedly a plug and play uh, sort of deal, but we're about to find out. So, worth noting that the uh, old axle will no longer be used. We'll just. Uh, put it down here for now the new axle uh, it did come with the crown nut and a washer I think I bought this on eBay for like 15 or 20 bucks uh, it's just a used axle from a second gen Virago um, but we're gonna have to grease it up so let's do that real fast okay so in terms of getting the grease on there I like using this uh, Honda high temp urea grease uh, that stuff seems pretty good uh, in terms of getting parts like this greased up properly so just grab a, a light coating of it and grease the axle and it should be good you don't really need a lot this grease goes a long way okay so in terms of getting this uh, put together just like the old rim, the new rim comes with the final drive gear and wheel bearing on the left side. On the right side, another wheel bearing as well as the inner race for the uh, rear brake, uh, rear drum brake. So we we'll want to make sure that that race is pretty clean. You know, it doesn't need to be perfect, uh, but if you have any like huge uh, you know gashes in it or scrapes or anything out of the ordinary you're gonna end up wanting to replace the race I don't think it's easy to do it's pressed in there uh, to the point where you might be better off just buying a whole new rim if that's messed up I don't know exactly how that uh, replacement would work um, I don't know how it works, a, uh, but the service manual might shed some light on that uh, that procedure. Maybe it's not as hard as I think it is, uh, in case you end up having to do it. But luckily it doesn't look like I'm going to have to. The race looks pretty good. So, Okay, so to get this wheel in, into the back, uh, being that it's big and fat compared to the OEM one, I've seen people do this one of two ways. Um, some of them deflate the tire to get it in there. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have to do that. Or I'm going to try not to. Because uh, as you can see, I can get it in there now. Uh, now that I've made way for it. But I've seen some people deflate the tire that might make it a little easier. Uh, but otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to put the pieces in. So this is the final drive hub. That just kind of pops in place here. And then the uh, rear brake hub, which if I recall, also just pops right in. So then the trick sort of becomes how to basically pop it in place and keep everything aligned. In all honesty, this would be easier with two people. So if you have a helper, they might be really useful for this. And there we go. With all that more or less in place, should be able to get this uh, get this bolt in there. To help hold it, 
when we get the axle in. If I recall, we had this uh, washer here. Very good. And then finally, one washer here and your crown nut to keep that in place. Okay. That's a tight fit, but it does fit the uh, 150 tire and gives it a much fatter look. Nice. Plus I get the five spokes to match the R6 front. I think that'll look a lot better. Cool. Let's go ahead and button it up in terms of putting the, uh, putting all the bolts back on, getting the cutter pins back in place, that's that, that sort of thing. We'll tighten it all up and uh, go from there. So we'll go ahead and so we'll go ahead and put the uh, cotter pin back in place. You'll notice that uh, the new second gen axle, while it fits, uh, has a little less space, or I'm sorry, a little more space in between where the cotter pin is located compared to where the, uh, you know, the actual subframe sits flush. Um, and I think it's gonna be fine, uh, especially considering once we torque this guy down, you know, it'll it'll tighten itself up pretty good. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have to do anything, but worst case scenario, we add a couple washers in between this and the subframe, um, just to make sure it's got a nice stiff hold. Uh, we'll go ahead and put the uh, license plate bracket back in place. Remember, it's got two lock washers in between the bolt here. Um, let's not go ahead and tighten this down all the way just yet, but I wanna get it in place just to make sure we're not Forgetting it and making sure that it still has clearance, which it does. Um, so that's good. Uh, it looks like our uh, little fix there of removing that uh, tiny bracket worked real well. You know, we have barely a finger uh, in between the tire and the subframe now. Uh, <clears throat> so that's good. The, uh, the bar itself, you'll notice it's not going to fit anymore with the uh, stock location it's too close to rubbing that tire so we're gonna pop it out just a uh, just a little bit like that uh, a couple spacers should do the trick or washers uh, should get us where we want to go let's go ahead and pop all this stuff back in place um, you know before we uh, get too far with it okay make sure you got all four of these bolts tight and the one that uh, mounts it to the swing arm as well. Make sure you get the, uh, the crown nut as well as its cotter pin in place. And that should give the axle some breathing room in terms of being able to rotate. At least as far as I know, it's supposed to be able to rotate. It's not supposed to be like fully clamped down until you tighten this bolt. Uh, so once you tighten that bolt, it shouldn't spin anymore and then you should be good to go. And sure enough, with the pinch bolt tightened down, obviously it's now pinched that axle in place, and it shouldn't rotate nearly as much, if at all. But of course, now you have a nice, uh, you know, a nice good axle to rotate the wheel around, and the brake hub still rotates. Let's go ahead and remove the uh, linkage for now, uh, since the breaker bar is a little bit more important. Um, as much as I'd like to get this to a better length, uh, I don't want to cut it. Uh, even though like cutting it and rewelding it and making it shorter uh, seems logical and maybe is something we're going to end up having to do. Um, but if possible, I'd like to not cut it, you know, just to maintain its original strength. Because um, it is a pretty heavy duty bar. Uh, you know, and I'd like to keep it that way. 
instead of breaking it. So um, let's look at how we can do this. Well, that's unfortunate, but it's kind of starting to look like the reality is that we're going to have to cut the bar. Okay, well, it's a little disappointing because it's going to add to the workload, but this is what we're going to have to do. Um, I don't think there's a good way to keep the stock length of this breaker bar. Um, mostly considering that we've only got so much linkage here, and we want to try and keep this uh, as close to the bottom as we can. So I can't really like justify moving it all the way up here, you know. Um, I mean, I suppose I could, but it just makes it harder because, you know, I can really only get it to about there. And I suppose that might work. Um, but then I have to figure out something, you know, about re redoing this, which, you know, maybe I could have built it, extended out just a little bit more. Because um, the, uh, again, we built this for the original Virago, and the second gen hub was a little bit smaller. Um, so this one's a little bit larger, and it doesn't quite fit the license plate frame as well. So, like, maybe we could extend this and keep it up and keep the length of the bar. Um, but instead, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the license plate frame alone. We're going to chop this bar, uh, you know, so that I can still mount it here. But we're going to chop maybe two to three inches out of the, in the center of this bar, weld it back in place. So, yeah, we, we want to kind of leave this down a little bit lower so that it has a better ability to pull when you jam on the brake. Otherwise, you're going to jam on the brake and it's going to have to kind of pull down instead of pull forward, um, which I think might weaken the overall braking pressure that can be applied to that. Um, so yeah, I think the best option here is going to be to chop this up so that we can lose a couple inches out of it and end up keeping it in place. So what we're going to do is kind of eyeball some marks here, which I think means we're going to end up wanting to take a few inches out. So we'll go, want to go ahead and cut it right about here where my finger is. That way we can chop out a good three inches or so and then weld in the last half of the bar. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the other end of this bar and essentially like cut out a couple inches of it and weld that together so it's a few inches shorter. Uh, let's go and do some measurements real fast. I'll come back and we'll go from there. So a little eyeball measurement puts us right about here where we need to cut. So we're really only going to lose about an inch or so out of this thing. Um, so we need to chop out that inch, weld this back together, and then, uh, and then we'll be good to go. Now we'll weld these things together and uh, be ready to put it back, put it back on the bike. And as with any welding, make sure you have a clean spot to do it. You know, you ground it down to bare metal. Um, in terms of welding this specifically, uh, you know, you want to make sure it's as straight as possible uh, before you hit it with the welder and make sure that you have your uh, bolt holes lined up. They need to be uh, aligned properly the same way on both ends of the bar uh, so that we can mount it properly. So let's uh, get to welding. Piece welded together. Not pretty, but it'll do the trick. We'll grind it down and paint it and get it back on the bike. There's the weld ground down. Not pretty, but strong. So that should be more than enough for us. We'll uh, slap it with a little paint here. I'm gonna go outside to do it actually, and we'll be good. Okay, so in terms of getting this bar back in place, this is basically the nut we're gonna end up replacing it with. Uh, and you realize there's a lot of stuff on here, but essentially this is a new, a new screw that's longer than the stock original one. Comes with a uh, brand new nylon threaded lock nut. And then you'll see that we have one washer here 
a, a thicker spacer washer there, a second washer, standard washer, and then we have this unique kind of spacer where the spacer is actually like uh, one piece that has a uh, uh, a washer kind of attached to it, you know, to give a, a larger flat uh, surface there. So we'll put that, slide it on like that. And then finally we have one more washer, a lock, a lock washer, and a lock nut. So all of these together, we'll essentially lock that bar in place back on the, uh, on the mount where it's supposed to be. And I'll show you why we have so many of these. First things first, we want the, uh, the screw and at least one washer, or one washer there, to go on the outside of this. Okay. The next step is we want this thick washer to actually slide in, in between these, uh, these plates. The original Virago, this is where that bar would mount. So the bar would mount in between these two plates. But because we're extending the bar out a few inches, uh, we want to put a washer in between here. So this one should do the trick just fine. And we'll go ahead and push the washer in place and then slide the screw in to keep it to keep it there. Then we want to put another one of these washers on the other end so that now we have a decent mating surface there. Here's where this guy comes in. This is actually the spacer that will actually push that bar over about an inch so that it can clear the tire. Okay. Then we'll put the bar in and then these two washers and the lock nut and we'll tighten everything down. Uh, this is the bolt, the original bolt that went with the uh, Virago's braking hub. You'll notice that it too has a uh, flat mated surface there as well as a washer and a lock washer and no, no lock nut but just a standard nut. So we'll take this guy Freshly coated in flat black. And there you see we have good clearance across all this stuff now. Let's go ahead and put the washers in place. And I think we won't need the other lock washer. We have a lock nut. So we'll just uh, use the one washer and the lock nut like that all right and then this guy just pops in the back and he actually he's actually fitted behind there so you can't like turn it which is nice but on this one we do want to use the lock washer because this is not a lock nut you'll notice that this nut also has a place for a cotter pin, so we'll want to replace that as well. Very good. And that's more or less exactly what we wanted to see. So now we should be able to reseat this thing. Part of me is actually a little curious. I do kind of like this one a little better, if only because it is straight. You know, I wonder if, uh, if we use this one instead, you know, like... Would it be a better fit like that? Maybe. Might be a little cleaner. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go ahead and pop this one off and we'll use the other one. Oh, this guy just has a tiny 10 millimeter nut that you can slide out. A small lock washer or yeah, lock washer. And then this fancy thing here along with the adjusting nut and washer. So to use this guy, all right, we wanna make sure that the unthreaded side is facing outward and the threaded side is facing inward. We'll slide the, uh, I don't know what to call that, retainer. Put this back in place. Loosen both the nuts if you have to, like I just did, until you can get it on to where it meshes into the gears appropriately. After which, just 
to be able to pop it in just like all the others. Now you can tighten the screws again to make sure you have a nice good flat seal. Very good. And then finally, the uh, pinch bolt there, which is also a 10 mil. Let's go ahead and tighten everything up and we'll be done with the wheel swap. Okay, with everything tightened down, cotter pin in place, all the bolts are in place. I didn't have a uh, uh, cotter pin small enough to fit that one particular one, so I just used a little ring clamp for the time being. Um, tighten this guy up, you know, now we got a, a good braking action. It should be, uh, give us a real nice feel to the brake. And everything tightened up on the other side means I think we're done. I think that's a pretty good deal. So yeah, uh, that's the uh, Yamaha Virago rear wheel swap from the second generation uh, Virago. Hope you guys all enjoyed watching this uh, video. I uh, hope it was informative. If you're looking to get a fatter tire onto your Virago, this is how you do it. I don't think you're going to be able to get anything larger than a 150 onto the rear. I mean, there's just like no extra clearance. 160 maybe. Um, I don't know, but overall, I think this worked out real well. That uh, Michelin Commander 2, I think is going to be a pretty sharp tire. Uh, should be real nice for, for riding around on, so I think that's good. This about wraps it up for uh, whatever episode this is, 23, I think, 24, 23. Um, and now that the wheel's in place, uh, tomorrow we're going to get together and do the battery box, and hopefully we'll get that installed. Uh, I mostly wanted to get the wheel in place so that when I finish doing the battery box, I'll make sure there's enough clearance down there for the, this big fat wheel. So now that that's back on, shouldn't be too hard to get finished. Uh, I guess we're about calling a night right, right here. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, do the thing. Um, maybe check out my game, Ethereal Legends, on Steam. And uh, hopefully I'll catch up with you guys on the next one. Thanks again.